Welcome to um, the opening night of the LSE Festival, New World Disorders, which is taking place um, all week uh, through um, Saturday. My name's Peter Trubowitz. Um, I'm the head of the um, Department of International Relations and the director of the US Center uh, at the LSE. So over the course of the week, um, the festival is bringing together um, global thinkers to consider the big challenges that um, society faces today and crucially how the social sciences um, might help us um, begin to tackle them. We're living in an age of insecurity where the values of liberal democracy, liberal economies and a rules-based um, international system are being challenged. And tonight we're going to focus on one important um, dimension of this phenomena, the mounting discontent and deepening pessimism about the future, especially but not only among the advanced democracies of the West. What explains it and what can be done about it? And we have two terrific speakers tonight to help us begin the process of thinking through uh, these very large questions. Uh, they include the LSE director, Manoush Shafiq, who has spent most of her career straddling the worlds of public policy and academia, previously working at the World Bank, the IMF, and the Bank of England. And Andres Velasco, the dean of the LSE's New School of Public Policy, and a former minister of finance in Chile. Unfortunately, uh, Stephanie Flanders, who is on the, um, on the schedule, on the program, is unable to join us tonight. Um, but we're in very good hands here, I think. Um, tonight's panel discussion um, also is part of a, <coughs> I don't know, like a social science experiment. We do those here at the LSE to see how a week-long discussion about developments across the globe make you feel about the future. More optimistic and bullish, more concerned and worried. And you can join directly in this debate using the hashtag LSE Festival and New World Disorders. And I know that the numbers are already going up on, on, on Facebook and, uh, and Twitter as well. And that includes those of you who are watching this, of course, uh, this event live streamed. For those of you in the theater, you may be wondering why the stewards gave you this keypad on entering. It's not so you can kind of like check sports scores while we're going along here. The idea is we're going to run a poll or do a survey at the end towards the conclusion of tonight's um, uh, event. Um, to, I don't know, take your pulse on whether you're feeling more optimistic or pessimistic about, about the future. And then what's going to happen, so this is really like a classic, like a pretest and a post-test. On Saturday, they're going to do the same thing again in the concluding uh, session. And so I guess the intervention here are all these academics and global thinkers and so forth who are talking over the course of the week to see whether or not it moves the needle in one direction or um, the other. I'll say a little bit more about this when we get to the, um, towards the end of uh, tonight um, and when we'll do the, uh, the poll. Um, and finally, I think just one kind of public service message. So this event is being recorded um, and uh, hopefully it'll be available as a podcast that, you know, kind of depends on the quality of the production, which means very few interruptions, which means if you haven't already put your phone on silent, please do that now. <laughs> um, and with that, please join me in welcoming um, LSE Director Manoush Shafiq. Good evening, everyone. What I wanted to ask this evening is, why are people in some of the richest and most successful countries in the world so pessimistic? 
when so much of the economic, social, and political data shows that things are getting better. And where did all that anger and anxiety come from that manifests itself in populism, terrorism, worsening well-being, and mental health? So I'm going to ask three questions. First, is pessimism widespread despite these improvements? Second, what are the causes of pessimism? And I'm going to focus on two, the changing nature of the media and fears about the future, both economic and political. And third, I'm going to ask, why is pessimism a problem and what can we do about it? I'm not going to spend a lot of time this evening uh, on the easy part of the story, which is that things have gotten hugely better. The evidence on the massive improvement in the human state is, is widely available. Probably the two authors who've done the most to compile that evidence are the American psychologist Steven Pinker and the Swedish statistician Hans Rosling. And you read their books and you cannot help but feel optimistic about how well we have done. We are richer, healthier, safer, and that at any time in human history, the historian Yuval Hariri uh, has said, in the early 21st century, for the first time in human history, more people die from eating too much than eating too little. And for the first time, more people commit suicide than all the people who die from, that are killed by war, crime, and terrorism. What an extraordinary state of the world. But all those reams of data and publications that demonstrate this massive human progress in recent decades have done very little to shift public opinion, which is characterized in, certainly in the advanced economies by what I call a declinist narrative. Now, clearly not everyone has benefited from this human progress. It's been unevenly distributed. But setting aside the issue about relative benefits, there is no doubt that over the last century, Human, the human state has massively improved. And what I want to focus on this evening is not the objective improvements, but on the subjective perceptions of what has happened and what that has done to our societies. So let me give you some evidence around why pessimism is rampant. So here are just a few examples. Most people in the UK, in fact, 88% of people in the UK, if you ask them, will tell you that global poverty has increased, even though in the last three decades we witnessed the sharpest decline in global poverty ever witnessed in human history. When people around the world are asked about what's the murder rate in your country, or how many people have died from terrorism, or how many teenage girls get pregnant, they invariably provide an estimate that is incorrect and is overly pessimistic. And some countries are particularly <coughs> over, overly pessimistic. So South Africa takes the prize, followed by Brazil and the Philippines, Peru, and then India. And as always, the countries in which are the least overly pessimistic and have the narrowest misperceptions on these kinds of questions are the happy Scandies, the Sweden, Norway, and Denmark, who are most get, guess the most closely to reality on these kinds of questions. In surveys, when people are asked whether the next generation will be better off than they better off than their parents, there is a very clear pattern. In the advanced economies, like the U.S., almost all the European countries, and Japan, most people think their children will be worse off than their parents. In most developing and emerging co countries. The vast majority, if you look across Africa, Asia, Latin America, think their children will be better off than their parents. And in a recent survey in eight countries, which was brought to my attention by a colleague here at the LSE, Terry Patterson, found that 61% of people felt more insecure as a result of global risk today. And climate change was identified as a global catastrophic risk by 48% of people, and an additional 36% tended to agree with climate change being a catastrophic risk. So those are all, I think, good examples of where pessimism is rampant, despite the fact that things have got better. What are the causes of this pessimism? But well, Anders is going to talk a lot about the differences between local and individual views and national and global views. I'm going to focus on two things. First, 
the changing media landscape and how we get our information, and second, fears about the future. Let me start with the media. Now, there is, there is no doubt that part of the pessimism is because people get their local information about myself, my community, through their lived experience, and they get their national and global information mediated through the media. And if you look at trends in media coverage over time, it has clearly got more negative. There's a, an interesting piece of work which uses a technique called sentiment mining. And they look at every newspaper article in the New York Times from 1945 to 2005. And then they do a similar exercise looking at all articles that have been translated into English in 130 countries from 1979 to 2010. And the pattern is very clear. And sentiment mining, the, what they look for is how often do these articles use positive words like good or nice, and how often do they use negative words like horrific or terrible. Very clear pattern. Over the last decades, the tone of the media has got more negative. And that's true uh, across countries. Now, of course, social media, with its competition for clicks, uh, has only accelerated this trend. It has exacerbated the tendency for people to ignore long-term trends of improvement, and they end up paying much more attention to sudden bad events. And when they get asked in surveys about the state of the world, these dramatic sudden events loom large in how they answer the question. Let me turn to the second explanation, which uh, is the fear about future prospects. Now, when people feel the future, f fear the future, they aren't very comforted by the fact that they are living better than their ancestors. And so the fact that things have got better <coughs> in the past doesn't provide them much succor. And those fears are grounded not just in current experience of things like low wages and precarious work, but also on the impact of technology will have on future jobs and the place of their nation in the wider world. So let me say something about each of those. First, economic prospects, and then more the kind of political position of your country. Now, on economic prospects, we know that automation will mean that about half of jobs that are routine and repetitive will be automated. And we know that hundreds of millions of workers are likely to be displaced by this transition. There's also a further risk of further bifurcation of labor markets. And so if you look, for example, at the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, they predict that for every new highly paid jobs that will, job that will appear in software development, there will be six new low paid jobs in the care sector. And so people are very worried about where they will end up in terms of future employment. And compounding that anxiety about technology and what it will do to economic prospects, is the rise of precarious work at low wages with minimal benefits. And while some find benefits from these flexible arrangements, many people experience serious economic insecurity. And many young people experience what is now called a, a stage of prolonged adolescence, which means sleeping on the sofa at home, having little prospect for actually saving enough to make a deposit and own your own home, and almost <coughs> no hope of ever having a pension. And we know from research that precarious employment reduces both physical and mental health, and individuals lose a sense of agency over their own lives. So even though we're living in a period of unprecedented wealth, many people look to the future with trepidation and fear. Let me turn to the fear about the political future. Now, this declinist narrative is partly a product of the fact that the West has dominated the world for the last 400 years. And people in the West are adjusting to the fact that the future is likely to be dominated by the East. Now, this de declinism has a very long tradition. In the UK, it has a particularly long tradition with the fall of the empire. Dean Atchison had that famous quote, the Britain, that the British have lost an empire and not yet found a role. And it has been the kind of dominant theme of UK foreign policy probably for the last century. For the US, declinism is a relatively new thing. There were episodes when the US was panicked about Japan dominating the world and dominating the, the world economy. And of course, the Soviet Union was a strategic rival for the cold, during the period of the Cold War. But I think in retrospect, we look back and given the Soviet Union's economic vulnerabilities, it's seen as a little bit of a paper tiger. I think the rise of China presents a whole new different 
strategic challenge to the US and the West, focusing much more on technological competition, the geopolitical positioning of China, and the fact that China represents an alternative economic model, let's call it authoritarian state capitalism, uh, which presents a, a real competitor to the prevailing model of liberal democracies and liberal economies. And the problem, though, with this declinist narrative is that it focuses on relative progress rather than absolute progress. So just because China's getting <coughs> doesn't mean the US is getting poorer. In fact, as any economist who understands the gains from trade will tell you, the reason the US continues to get richer is because its trading partners, like China, are getting wealthier. But it's this confusion between absolute and relative that, that I think fuels this declinist pessimism. And of course, there are very legitimate issues around fair access to markets in China and protection of intellectual property. And of course, one has to sort those out because they're key for making sure that relative decline is still associated with absolute gains for everyone. Now, let me turn to why is pessimism a problem and what, needs to be, what can be done about it. Well, pessimism is a problem because it's based on false assumptions. It can distort politics and policies. <coughs> if people in your country think that terrorism is a huge problem, you will spend huge amounts of money on scanners and screening and all sorts of anti-terrorism message, which, which might be actually a complete waste of resources. Secondly, pessimism fuels support for populist leaders who often use nostalgia politics and fear of the future to scare people into supporting them. And finally, studies have actually found that optimism is good for your health. <laughs> <laughs> There's been some very uh, interesting piece of work by Bohm and Kubansky, who reviewed over 200 medical research articles, which found that a positive psychological outlook reduces your risk of cardiovascular illness by 50%. So it's really significant. So what can be done to address this pessimism crisis in the advanced economies. Well, let me say something about the media and then something about restoring confidence in the future. On the media, now I know the conventional wisdom is good news isn't news. It's the, the, the tendency of the media to, to focus on bad news uh, is the way they sell, is the way they sell, I was gonna say newspapers, but they don't sell newspapers anymore. <laughs> the way they sell, they sell clicks, attention, and, and coverage. But I think we have to ask ourselves, is there a way to get greater context and balance? And I think, you know, if you, if you look at the polling data today, something called the Edelman Trust Barometer, the media, including social media, is now the least trusted institution in our societies. Less trusted than government politicians, less trusted than business, less trusted than any other institution in our society. And I do think we're at a moment when we need to rethink uh, the role of the media. And we might be on the cusp of a, a position where people all do want to see greater regulation of fake news, greater responsibility of platforms for what they post online. I, for one, would strongly support such a shift because I think we've reached a stage where the current state of pessimism and distrust has actually become a huge problem for both our democracies and our economies. Now let me say something about restoring confidence in people's economic prospects. And here I think there's a very clear and tractable agenda. In order to have a successful transition that technology will force on our societies, we need to facilitate the transition of workers to new jobs. And for this to be successful, workers need to feel <coughs> that they will be invested in, that societies will invest in new skills so that they can cope with the impact of automation and and, and machine learning on the job market. Unfortunately, if you look today across the OECD, spending on worker retraining has actually fallen steadily. And we, we must reverse that. That is clearly not sensible given the huge change in labor markets that we are about to face. Moreover, giving part-time and temporary workers access to benefits, uh, and part-time and temporary workers tend to be lower skilled and lower paid, giving them rights to pensions, to paid leave, and to training, as has been done in some countries like Germany, Denmark, and the Netherlands, would do a huge amount to restore a sense of security and optimism for those people. And people need to know that if they fall on hard times, there will be a social safety net to catch them. 
uh, policymaking also needs to make well-being more central to the way we think about our priorities. At the LSE, we have quite a few people working on issues about how well-being can shape economic priorities, people like Richard Laird and Paul Dolan. And not surprisingly, mental health is at the core of that agenda, but so is fostering a sense of community and sustaining relationships. Finally, let me say something about politics and giving people more of a sense of control. Psychological research by Segelman points to a link between a sense of control and optimism. And I think we can all relate to that finding. When we feel that our lives are out of control, we feel stressed and sad. And when we have a greater sense of control, we feel happier, <laughs> healthier, and more optimistic about the future. That's why the slogan, the Brexit slogan, take back control, was so clever because it appealed to that, to that fear and it provided people a sense of there's a solution to the fact that I feel my life is out of control. It also helps explain why we can be individually optimistic and nationally pessimistic because we're more likely to have a sense of control over our individual lives, but it feels very hard, especially these days, to feel any sense of control of what's happening in the country or in the world. I'm increasingly of the view that decentralization is part of the solution to give people a sense of more local control. More local power gives people more a sense of control and autonomy of things that directly affect their lives. It's where people experience democracy most closely. It's where they have a better perception of local services like schools and local politicians. If you ask people, how's your local MP? They'll say, oh, it's pretty good. If you ask them, what do you think of parliament? Oh, it's rubbish. <laughs> How, how's your local teacher? Oh, it's pretty good. My kids are happy. How do you think, what do you think about education in this country? Oh, it's rubbish. So that bringing things more local, I think, is part of the solution. It also provides you a way to potentially accommodate more local preferences just as an example that we've been debating recently, if different parts of a country have very different views about immigrants, why not give them different powers over how many immigrant workers they can have in their locality, have geographically specific work permits? So if London wants to have lots of immigrants, that's okay. If some other bit of the country doesn't, well, okay, they can decide that if they want, but that doesn't, then that gives them a greater sense of local control just a hypothesis. I think the problem with decentralization, to be honest, is it's not a panacea. It doesn't solve the problems that I think Andreas is going to talk about now. And it doesn't solve the fact that we have a democratic deficit at the supranational level. Many of the problems we need to solve are global and require global solutions. And it's hard to see how decentralization is going to help us with that. But perhaps that's something we can discuss uh, later in, in the conversation. I'll turn it over. Thank you. So, Andres, was Manoush too optimistic? A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> There are few things more intellectually fashionable than pessimism. If you're an academic, you can build a career being a pessimist. If you're a politician, you can build several careers being a pessimist. I used to be a politician, I wasn't a pessimist. Now I'm here. So I could be. I could be a pessimist, but I will not be. And I want to begin with exactly the same emphasis as Minouche began. The world is getting much better all the time. Think of the first fact Minouche quoted. We are in the first decade in human history in which more people are having to die because they've eaten too much than from having eaten too little. That's an extraordinary fact. Obesity is, in fact, in the world today, a bigger problem than starvation. And there are million domains along which one can cite number after number and statistic after statistic to suggest that we're healthier, we live longer, 
and overall our quality of life has gone up and up and up. If you don't believe me, well, you can believe somebody who has just written a marvelous book about it, and that guy is my former colleague, Steven Pinker. Uh, re- leave this room, log on, go online, and buy that book because you will feel much better. Pinker is not only a great academic, he's also an extraordinarily persuasive and skillful writer. And he makes a very, very strong case that, in fact, the world is getting better. Now, before we get too optimistic, we should note that things may be getting better, but they're not getting better at the same speed for everyone. And forgive me if I um, quote another Harvard researcher, a guy called Raj Chetty from the economics department, who's been doing amazing work with hard data, trying to figure out how the fortunes of children fare compared to to the fortunes of their parents. We have lots of survey data in which people report, oh yeah, I'm doing better than my parents or worse than my parents, but that's self-reported data. Chetty has actually compiled a pretty large data set in which he looks at objectively whether American children, and this is only a data set for the US, are doing better or worse than their parents, and whether this mobility has gone up or down over time. And what he finds is actually not that optimistic. In the 1940s, in fact, his data goes as back as the 1940s, 90% of children were living better than their parents had lived a generation ago. Today, that number is 50%. So you can say from 90 to 50, that's a big drop. On the other hand, 50 is not so bad. 50% of people even in this context of pessimism, even in this context of recession, even in a context of growing inequality, are in fact, not self-reporting, in fact, living better than their parents. Why did we go, according to Chetty, from 90 to 50? Some of it has to do with simply slower economic growth. The US is a rich country, doesn't grow very much, much less than it used to. But some of the change also has to do with increasing inequality. In fact, he finds that you could go back not to 90, but to 70% if we had in the US today the same distribution of income the US had back in 1940. So yes, the world is getting better, but not everybody's life is getting better, and not everybody's life is getting better at the same time. Now, there's a risk in this debate, and the risk is that uh, we could be guilty of Anglocentrism. Meaning, a lot of the data and a lot of the papers and a lot of the studies come basically from the US or the UK. And the US and the UK are two countries where, in fact, the income distribution has gone down, economic growth is lower than it used to be, and median wages are not doing quite as well as we're doing 10, 20, and especially 40 or 50 years ago. But it is very risky, and I would argue completely wrong to extrapolate from the experience of these two countries to a a more global phenomenon. Because if you're looking for the causes of populism, you might be tempted to conclude that in all the other countries of the world where today we're seeing populism, think of Brazil, think of Italy, Turkey, the Philippines, Hungary, Poland, just to name a few, you might be tempted to say, well, they must be undergoing exactly the same economic problems as the US or the UK, and therefore, that is the cause of the problem. Well, if you made that conjecture, that conjecture would be plain wrong. Because what may be true of the very advanced economies, and particularly the economies of the North Atlantic, is not at all true of emerging markets. Because emerging markets over the last 25 years have grown and grown and grown. Let me mention data for two of the countries that have recently gone populist. One is Turkey, and one, the other one is the Philippines. If you begin measuring at the time of the financial crisis a decade ago, all the way until last year, on average, economic growth in Turkey was 6.9% per year. And in the Philippines, the number was 6.8%. It wasn't quite as high in Hungary or Poland. You wouldn't expect it to be the richer countries. Uh, But on the whole, many of the countries which in fact have gone populist, where the politics has turned sour, are countries in which economic performance, unemployment performance, wage performance 
has been very good indeed. So it is very hard to conclude, and in fact it is empirically wrong to conclude, that there are a bunch of objective facts out there, particularly economic facts, that are driving people to this pessimism. And if that is mostly untrue for the UK, the UK and the US, it is entirely untrue for the emerging markets. So the narrative there has to be different. Now, as you listen to me, you could be thinking, OK, this guy is telling me that the world is doing fine. So if the world is doing fine, why are we apparently so depressed? <laughs> and I want to take a different tack in answering that, that question that M Minouch did. I agree with most of what he, she said, but let me emphasize a slightly different <coughs> aspect. When we say we're being pessimistic, the question is pessimistic about what? Because I could be very pessimistic or optimistic about my own life and my family's prospects, and I could be pessimistic about my neighborhood, my city, my region, my country, or the world. And what is very striking about data all across the globe, and this is truly not just a rich country phenomenon, is that what people report about their own lives is almost always much more optimistic than what they report about the wider world in which they live. Let me give you three examples. There's something called the Eurobarometer, which measures sentiment across countries in the European Union. If you ask people, how is your own family economic situation doing? 60% of people saying, it's doing OK. I expect it to remain the same. 20% say, it is going up. It is getting much better. However, if you ask people, how is your country's or Europe's economic situation doing, 60% report that it's getting worse. So if you're a statistician, we have a problem here, because presumably the country is nothing but the sum of all people. And it turns out individuals are doing fine, but the country is doing terrible. This reminds me, uh, if you're, any of you ever lived in the US, there used to be a radio program by a guy called Garrison Kaler about a town in the Midwest, this idyllic, beautiful pastoral community in which all children are always above average. Uh, it seems that uh, in Europe, people's fortunes are, in fact, always above average. Now, this is not just a European phenomenon. I come from Chile, and in Chile there's a, a fairly serious poll that four times a year asks people, how are you doing? And then asks, how is the country doing? Year after year after year, while you're talking about income or wages or employment, people always say, oh, my life, my life is fine. The country, oh, the country's going to the dogs. And not only is that gap persistent, the gap has been getting much larger with time. Third example, there's plenty of data, uh, mostly for Europe, about what people perceive is going on with the environment. And yes, of course, we have serious environmental problems. But again, you ask people, what about the environment in your immediate community? Oh, it's fine. What about the nation? Terrible. The world? Again, going to the dogs. Which may or may not be true, but it is puzzling. It calls for explanation that what we feel about our own lives is very different than what we feel about the world at large. And in fact, this phenomenon has been studied. It is not new. Uh, and uh, Hans Roser, uh, I'm sorry, Max Roser, whom we knew Scheider already, Swedish economist who used to be at Oxford, I uh, gave it a name. He talks about local optimism and national pessimism. Why this gap? I'm not sure I have the answer, so let me try a few hypotheses. First hypothesis is simply that this did not begin yesterday. There's a pretty broad academic literature in psychology that says, our brains are hardwired for optimism. And this is, of course, a fruit of evolution. Back in the day when we were sort of running around trying not to be eaten by large animals, uh, we had to be optimists. You know, if I felt that uh, I was going to be eaten by a lion in the next 48 hours, then I probably wouldn't have a very uh, pleasurable life. So your chances of survival are higher if you're an optimist. I get up in the morning and I think I will not be consumed by a lion. Uh, now, what's the catch? that this hardwiring for optimism operates at the local level, at the individual level. I will not be eaten by a lion, as opposed to my fellow beings. They could be. So there could be something in our mental structure, in our psychological structure, that in fact accounts for this gap. However, that cannot be the full explanation. Because if the gap is getting larger, you need to explain it by means of a variable that is also getting larger. 
And our psychological makeup may change over millennia, but it doesn't change over decades. Therefore, that alone uh, cannot be it. So what are plausible explanations? Why is the gap not only there, why is the gap getting large? And here, I think there are two candidates. One Minouche already mentioned, the other one he mentioned in passing, and I want to uh, expand upon it. The first potential villain in the room is, of course, the media. And I say this with great hesitation because I'm married to a journalist and every time I bring this up at dinner time, I am on the losing side of the conversation, so I will be careful with my words here. But there is evidence that if you go and, in fact, try to correlate this gap in perceptions with people's exposure to the media, that correlation is, in fact, in the data and quite strong. That is, the more you're exposed to the news media, and in addition, the more you're exposed to social media, the more you think, oh, my life is fine, however, the world is not doing well. So it's not just a conjecture. There is some data to back this up. And as Minou said, the very definition of the media is to be pessimistic. Pinker has a wonderful line in his book. He says, you have never turned the television set and found a reporter in a faraway land who says, I am reporting from a country where war has not broken out. Right? So, ah, you never say that. If war is not broken out, that's no news. I say this with surprise. My wife tells me it's absolutely obvious. And she quotes the old adage at me, if it bleeds, it leads. Clearly, good news. I used to be a minister in the government in Chile. I learned that whenever you had good news, nobody paid attention. If you had a crisis, believe me, the press were here. Uh, they were there listening to you. So yes, there's some element of media influence. I was going to say distortion, but I will refrain. <laughs> some media influence, in fact, in explaining this gap. What it is that you do about it, what is the policy implication of that observation, I will confess I am not sure. Yes, there are issues of fake news, no question about it. There are issues of misrepresentation, no question about it. To what extent public policy can affect that, I will be perfectly honest with you, I am not completely sure at all, and I'll be glad to engage on that question in the Q&A session. But before I stop, I want to bring up one other issue which in my mind is absolutely key, and that is politics. The other striking fact when you ask people about their perceptions of the world is how their esteem of politics has come down massively. The issue of lack of trust in politicians and lack of trust in government, and most worryingly, of lack of trust in democracy is absolutely widespread. A few weeks ago in this very same room, we had a visitor, a, a, a guy called Yasha Munk, who wrote a very good book called The People Against Democracy. Uh, again, a good reading recommendation for the weekend. Uh, the book is filled with survey data of you know, reporting simply that I don't trust my politicians, the parties in my country, the Congress in my party, the cabinet, the president, I don't really trust anybody. That is true of rich countries, of poor countries, of developed countries, of emerging countries. And it is particularly striking the degree to which the valuation of democracy has gone down in countries which only recovered, or in some cases gained democracy, a very short while ago. 20, 25 years ago, if you were Polish or Hungarian or Czech, or if you were Brazilian or Argentine or Chilean, you were just in the process of regaining democracy, and democracy, as an old professor of mine put it, was the only game in town. It was the thing that we were all very proud of. Uh, today, you ask Brazilians, do you trust your democracy? 9% of Brazilians report trusting their democracy. If you ask, ask Mexicans, the number's 16. The two largest countries in Latin America Neither one of them has one person out of five reporting that they trust democracy. How is this connected to the issue of um, local versus national pessimism? Well, I think quite simple. If I know my circumstances are OK, but I don't trust the government, and I am told by the media the country circumstances are terrible, well, I'm going to believe that, because my prior, my starting point is the government is no good, the politicians are no good, uh, and therefore I am perfectly predisposed to believe anything that is bad about the country, 
even though I know that in my life, things are not quite as bad as people are reporting out there. What's the policy implication of this? And I will finish. Well, as uh, James Carville famously put it, it is the politics stupid. Um, and let me leave you with two suggestions. The first one is simply political reform. One reason why people don't trust politicians is that in many countries they turn on the TV and it's been the same guys, and I say guys because it's mostly men, uh, on the tube for the last 20, 30, or 40 years. And therefore, the renewal of the elites, having a more transparent politics, a more competitive politics, a politics that is less captured by special interest and money, is a first step, not the end of the road, but the beginning of the road in regaining trust. The other uh, thing that seems absolutely essential to me is for liberal politicians and democratic politicians and moderate politicians to construct a narrative to rival the narrative of the populists who are saying the world is terrible, vote for me. If you, you know, remember Trump's speech at uh, the Democratic, uh, sorry, not the Democratic, what am I saying? The Republican convention, when he was nominated, he described, and I quote, a nation plagued by poverty, violence, war, and destruction. Doesn't quite sound like the United States where I used to live. Uh, um, um, and when confronted with that narrative of war and pestilence and destruction, liberal politicians do not have a comparable narrative to oppose to that. And I emphasize narrative because politicians are policy makers but they're also explainers. And the president is not simply the commander-in-chief, a president is also an explainer-in-chief. And a good politician or a good political movement is one which provides a coherent account of why we go through the things that we go through and what the future will look like. I think populists today are doing an admirable job of weaving together such a narrative liberal democratic politicians are not. As long as they continue, we continue to fail at that task, task. The world will continue maybe to get better, touch wood. However, the perceptions that we have of the world will continue to get worse and worse. Thank you very much. So I'm not feeling very optimistic. Uh, <laughs> so here I am. I'm with two economists. I'm a political scientist. Um, I suppose I have a question that, before I open it up, um, about causes. Um, I think you're probably getting a lot of questions about what are the remedies, and um, and 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 that is what we we should talk a lot about. But on the causes, I was struck, you both mentioned the media. Um, and I think in different ways, you both mentioned politics, uh, Andres, you directly in the form of kind of declining political trust that you see um, uh, across the West. And Manoush, I think maybe um, on the issue of restoring confidence in the economy, it's part of that is management of the economy. Um, and I wonder if, some of this has to do with something that um, neither of you focused on directly, um, but um, I think maybe in some ways helps connect the story here, and that's political parties and the decline of political parties. Um, I, I don't, you know, there's, um, there was a time, I mean, traditionally political parties, right, are seen as kind of transmission belts for aggregating up kind of local concerns and interests to the national level and generating a sense of, I don't know, collective purpose, shared prosperity. Um, and, you know, it seems to me, I, I mean, I'm more familiar with the U.S. side of this, um, but um, political parties for some time now have not been performing that function very well. And there's been a, an erosion. And in fact, there's a very high correlation, just separately, but kind of as a, between political trust and partisanship, an inverse relationship in the US between those two things. So as partisanship goes up, political trust in 
my government doing the right thing goes down. And so I, I wonder if some of this has to do with the failure of mainstream political parties mm -hmm. to just mm -hmm. do their job. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, I mean, some thoughts, reflections on that? You, you start off. Um, I feel a little shy about answering that question because, again, we're two economists and uh, Peter's a political scientist, so we, what do we know about political parties? Um, you, but, have, uh, you tried to set one up. Uh, I, yeah, I did. Yes. I, in fact, yes. fact, I used to be the president so of the first hand. <laughs> um, exactly. You know, I used to, when I first entered politics, there I was, you know, a technocrat. Um, I, I, back then I did not belong to a political party, so I often asked myself, what are they for? Mm. What, what, function do political parties perform? And I'm not sure I have the answer, but I did learn two things. One is um, it's connected to the last thing I said up there. Um, they provide an account or a narrative of what our country and our politics are about. Mm -hmm. And an identity, a word that we didn't use, but which of course is very fashionable nowadays. Mm -hmm. If you're a Democrat in the American Midwest uh, and you belong to a union, um, there was an account of what your life was like, what your values were like, and uh, uh, what were the things that you were fighting for. Maybe that account became obsolete, the world changed, but uh, parties did provide that frame of reference. With the decline of parties, that frame of reference is gone. The second thing parties do, and Peter's not going to like this because I'm going to use economist jargon to refer to a political uh, phenomenon, Parties internalize the externalities. Every policy has a nice aspect that voters like, but it has a not so nice aspect that voters may not like. Um, you know, it has a bit of sweet and a bit of spinach. And what political parties do is they say, okay, we realize that uh, this bill or this law has you know, a little sweet and a little spinach. Well, we will advertise the sweet, <coughs> we will de-emphasize the spinach, because overall we think it's good for the country. Um, Today, because parties are so weak and politics is so fragmented, mm -hmm. everybody is keen to emphasize the spinach uh, uh, to the detriment of the sweet. <laughs> um, and um, you get the phenomenon we've been talking about. So I think that's the analysis. Um, can we reconstitute political parties uh, to play those roles? I'm not sure. Uh, I think political parties were strong when you had electoral systems that mm -hmm. uh, that force people into parties. Increasingly, that is not necessarily the case. So where do we go from here? I will defer to you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think the thing I'd say is that I think we're at a very interesting moment where traditionally political parties, I mean, I always thought of them as sort of intermediaries of public views. Mm. Um, but there are sort of two versions of that. One is that I choose people to represent me whose values I share, mm -hmm. and then I trust their judgment mm -hmm. on the policies they choose. That is sort of, you represent my values, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to you represent the aggregation of the views of the people who've joined this party, in which case you really are a cipher. No. You know, you're, no. you're, not, you're not being chosen to exercise your judgment. And part of the problem we have at the moment, and again, this is probably the product of the huge rise in the use of polling by political parties to form their policies, mm -hmm. where they have become near aggregators of polls. And you know, one group polls its members, and they aggregate up the views. And then another group polls its members and aggregates up the views. And this has all been facilitated by the rise of the internet and the fact that aggregating up views has become very, very easy. Uh, and the role of values and judgment has disappeared. Um, and I can't help but believe that that's part of, that's fueling part of this cynicism. Um, you know, we've had some little experiments uh, like the Pirates Party in Germany where they said, we're going to crowdsource our policies. We're going to go to our members and we're going to basically say, what kind of policies do you want? And that's going to be our platform. And of course that failed miserably. Mm -hmm. right. and, in theory, the rise of social media and the internet should facilitate that kind of process. And I think, I think that tells us that that's not what people want, actually. What they want are leaders whose values they identify with, 
and then yeah. have those leaders actually use their judgment to agree on a set of policies. The slightly old-fashioned view, I no, think. No, I, th I think that's great. <laughs> so I think, that's um, right. I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll open it up um, now. We've got about, well, I've got to build in the poll. So <laughs> <laughs> I think we have about a half an hour to work with here. So what I'm going to do is I'll group questions take a few questions um, at a time, and, and I would just ask you to <coughs> make it a question, uh, very uh, short, to the point, briefly introduce yourself, and um, let's see, I saw a hand over there. We'll go right, we'll start right there. The gentleman in the, is it a black sweater? Yeah, right there, midway up. My, my name is Malcolm Dean. I'm a journalist. <laughs> <laughs> it is on The Guardian, though. For the last 40 years, I've been retired for 10. Um, I agree with you about the negative approach of the media. Uh, it's no wonder the public think politicians are hopeless because of the way we treat politicians in the media. But um, to put to the other side is it's very important that politicians have people to hold them to account. Mm. And the best papers do do that. New York Times, I've been in America, and Washington Post, we've been twinned with. Um, Two other quick points. One is there are now 70 journalists in Turkey in prison. Mm -hmm. That's one third of all the other prisoners, uh, uh, journalists that have been in prison. And two, both ever, all, all in the West, newspapers are being rocked. Where there isn't a paper in the UK that hasn't lost almost half its circulation. And even worse, lost a huge amount of advertising to the Amazons and Googles. Uh, so. In terms of in history, I don't think it will be seen to be as powerful today as it once was. Okay, there was a hand right back here. This woman uh, halfway up, or a third of the way up. Yeah. Right. Um, my name's Meg. I'm a Brexit voter, just to get everybody on my side. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you, so I wanted to mention two people. I wanted to mention Henry Ford and Margaret Thatcher. Henry Ford boosted productivity and um, turned human beings into cogs in the machine in the name of productivity. Margaret Thatcher says, you want everyone to be, you know, you, you, you want everyone to be, as long as everyone's poorer, if something like that, you know what she said. And, um, but Margaret, both of them didn't take into account that, uh, well, Margaret didn't take into account that wealth is relative to your neighbor and um, wealth is not just about figures like GDP and statistics like um, health or happiness. Wealth is about control, it's about status, it's about relativity to your neighbor. And um, so I would ask, isn't your, um, I guess the premise of the talk is that we should be happier because the figures show that we should be, but isn't that um, ignoring the, the human side of life? Okay, and let's take a hand in the back. How about the uh, two thirds of what woman, two thirds of the way up there? Yeah. Oh, guy, sorry. I, I can't, no, the woman right there, there. yes. Right, right behind there you go, thank you. There you go. I've got a Related question, I'm in the 50% of people uh, who's going to be less wealthy than my parents. Is there anything policy can do to make people uh, happier nonetheless in that circumstance? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to know the answer to that too. I have two sons. Um, so, okay, so we have like three questions here. Yeah. Uh, I, let me start with the... Uh, Poverty and wealth being relative. I mean, you're absolutely right. All the research shows is that people care about relative poverty, not absolute. There was a, I remember after the collapse of communism, there was a famous Ukrainian joke, which was they asked a Ukrainian villager, uh, I'll give you anything you want, but whatever I give you, I'll give your neighbor twice as much of. And that the sort of Ukrainian farmer looked at this guy, thought about it a while, and then said, take out an eye. <laughs> Human nature, what can you say, right? Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> um, I wanted to respond a little bit to the future of the, the media question, which I think was, you didn't ask the question, but I think that's implicit what, to what you were saying. There, there's, we've just completed a commission on truth, trust, and technology at the LSE, where we had big public consultations, a lot of faculty looking at these issues as, as to how do we restore trust in the media. And the, I, I mean, it's a very good piece of work, which you might want to read, which is on the web. It's called the Three T's Commission. But the bottom line of what they suggest is that we need um, an agreed code of conduct among all media providers, including the Facebooks and inter, you know, all the internet platforms. And then regulators need to be able to hold them to account for compliance with that code of conduct. So you don't have the government directly regulating the media in order to protect freedom of speech, but you force everyone who's providing information to the public to agree to a code of conduct about fact checking and et cetera, et cetera, and then you hold them to account. And so it's a little bit of reversing what you said. You, just as the media holds the politicians to account, the politicians also, the, the political process also holds the media to account to a set of agreed ethics and rules that the media itself decides. And I think that's actually quite a, an interesting solution. And maybe I'll give Andres the question of what do you do for the 50% who are going to be poor, other than bequests, right? You have to hope that the bequests work in your favor. <laughs> Let's see. Um, I want to say one thing about the connection between fake news, aggressive journalism on the one hand, and the quality of politics on the other. Um, the quality of people who go into politics is not God-given. Um, and one consequence of the current state of affairs is that a lot of people who might have gone into politics and done some good for their countries yeah. will not. Um, when I decided to run for office the first time in my life, I rang up my grandmother and said, you know, grandmother, I'm running for office. It was a long silence at the other end of the phone. <laughs> and she said, darling, your grandfather was a surgeon. Your father was a lawyer. Couldn't you get a decent job, please? Um, you know, and uh, I could see why my grandmother said that. Um, clearly, um, if politics is not viewed as a decent calling, you're going to get a lot of indecent people in politics. Yeah. And that's exactly what uh, is happening. And I think that, that back channel is something we don't always uh, appreciate. Mrs. Thatcher, uh, when you brought up Mrs. Thatcher, I thought you were going to quote her first famous line of, quote, there is no such thing as society. Um, and whether Thatcher's economics were right or wrong, uh, we'll say for a different uh, discussion, but I think on that point she has been revealed abundantly to have been wrong, because it is very hard to understand the subject matter at hand tonight without the interplay between the individual and society. In fact, what, what Manu said, and I, I reaffirmed this, well, perhaps we're doing okay. Nonetheless, we have a shared perception that we're not doing okay, and we cannot understand that without resorting to issues such as confidence, identity, which are very much part of what a society is all about. So as a way of thinking about the world, uh, I think that way has been revealed insufficient. Um, and uh, that is not only an academic point, it is also a political point. If you don't understand that, believe me, you're not going to get anywhere uh, in politics. Uh, children, uh, parents, money, um, I also have children, so um, I, I guess the economist in me, and forgive me for, um, for saying this, um, if 50% of people are going to be um, not as um, wealthy as the parents were, uh, it also um, and has had to be the case that 50% of people will. Um, uh, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, that's one of the few things that an economist can assert with full confidence. Uh, um, and and um, given that over the course of human history that was not often the case, um, I, I, a chart that is in many books, uh, Angus Deaton's book, the guy who won the Nobel Prize a few years back, also in Pinker's book, is, is, is a chart of per capita GDP over human history. It is, if you begin with the Greeks and go all the way to the present, it is flat, 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 flat. About 1800 begins to rise, 
and it continues rising and rising and rising. Yeah, a little dip uh, 10 years ago, a little dip of the Great Depression. But in the big scheme of things, we human beings are unbelievably much wealthier than any generation before us ever was. Uh, and that we should not forget. Hmm. Another round of questions. Um, how about the woman right there in the white sweater, I think it is, right there. Hello, Anita Hamilton. Um, I want to ask the panel, please, about trust and corporations, business, companies, the, um, those brands that we engage with every day, the fact that we have uh, leaders of big companies like Stephen uh, Philip Green and many others who are now distrusted, and that even the shiny, lovely companies that we thought they were going to be like Facebook and Google are not what they seem. Very good. I'll go to my left, then I'll come to my right. Um, this gentleman over here in the black sweatshirt. Yeah. Hi, my name is Soleil Shah. I'm a graduate student at LSE. Um, it seems hard to me to make the claim that the world has gotten better overall without defining what you mean by better. So sure, famine, plague, and war have declined, but why is it bad to be realistically pessimistic about ecological collapse and technological disruption. Are these issues less severe than ones confronted in the past? And how should we think about them in the context of pessimism? I'll let you think about that one for mm. a second, and we will. Yeah, these bloody LSE students. How about this guy know? down here in the, in the, in the front, uh, the black and white um, shirt? Thank you guys for uh, being here this evening, by the way. Uh, my name is Max Snyder. I'm a general course student uh, from Brandeis University in the States. Uh, my question is kind of about um, how the media has kind of the narrative that the media has presented in the rise of populism has been primarily negative in that the, there's been a backlash following the financial crisis, an increasing rural uh, and urban divide, an increasing uh, inequality disparity. To what extent do you think that's a correct depiction of, of the rise of populism and its causes? Mm -hmm. Okay. you want to go first? Maybe. Yes, on the environment first and then populism. Um, I am not an environmental expert, but uh, I've uh, hung around uh, a sufficient numbers to have a view on this. Um, yes, some uh, aspects of uh, the global commons are a big source of concern, global warming being, of course, the big, obvious elephant in the room. However, uh, it is not correct to say that every environmental problem is much worse today than it used to be. And again, Pinker has a whole chapter on this, which is very, very persuasive. Uh, uh, I never visited uh, London in the 1950s, but I'm told you, know, you couldn't see across uh, the square. <laughs> um, clearly, in, uh, in many places of the world, the quality of life uh, and, and, and the environmental aspects that determine that quality of life are hugely better than they used to be. Uh, so even there, I think one wants to be a little careful in being too pessimistic. The same is true of technological disruption. Yes, I'm sure uh, technological disruption, uh, as Minouche pointed out, is an issue for those people whose jobs are about to be automated out of uh, existence. But um, the fact that I can do uh, work when I'm in the train coming from my house to my job in the morning is also technological disruption, and it's pretty good. Um, um, mm. And I don't want to be a Pollyanna. I don't want to say that every job that is destroyed will be replaced by another job that will be higher paying. I'm aware that there will be some pain and some suffering and some dislocation along the way. But uh, over the big sweep of human history, technological <laughs> disruption has been a great creator of jobs. Um, and not a great destroyer of jobs. On populism, <coughs> um, we have just spent half an hour saying that the media is not doing its job. So I don't want to say that the media depi depiction of populism is the one thing they're doing right. Um, that would be, thank you, inconsistent. But I do want to say that the fairly negative depiction of the rise of populism is, in my opinion, uh, largely correct. Or let me put it the other way around. There is an intellectual fashion in some circles that says, well, democracy has become ossified and closed and elite driven, all of which is true. Uh, and as a result of that first observation, populist is a useful corrective to this ossified democracy. I think the second statement is not true. Uh, you can say, yes, in fact, there are lots of problems with our democracy and we should fix them without concluding that the answer to the democratic problems of the world is Vladimir Putin or Mr. Maduro in Venezuela, far from it. I think I might take the corporate question and it's interesting I think if you think about it 
the role of business and corporations. Let's just take a couple of hundred year perspective. I'm pretty confident that working conditions have improved dramatically over the last couple of hundred years. Conditions, sexual harassment in the workplace, I'm pretty willing to bet that even though we have no data that was collected 100 years ago, I'm pretty willing to bet that women in the workplace were treated much worse in the past than they are now. And so I do think we have to kind of, again, not to be too Pollyannish, but, but corporations have probably had to improve their behavior enormously in, in, in recent periods. I think one of the areas, though, that has probably got worse is, and again, I'm not going back hundreds of years, but I'm talking in decades, is the precariousness of the relationship between employers and employees. And that has become less strong. People turn over much more quickly than in the past. Uh, employers feel less obligation to their workers than they did in the past. And I do think that fuels a sense of insecurity uh, that we didn't have before. The decline of defined benefit pension schemes, the fact that uh, people have been able to hire on much more temporary contracts and that sort of thing. And I do think that has changed. I think that has fueled pessimism. I would just add one other thing, which I think is interesting. Uh, if you look at this Edelman Trust Barometer, which does polling across, I think, 35 countries on who people trust, in the last version, you know, everybody, most people do badly. Most people don't trust, obviously, governments, media, et cetera, et cetera. And there has been a secular decline in trust over time. But the one group that people tend to trust more in the recent data are their employers. Not business in the abstract, but the, pers the, the organization that employs them, hmm. uh, they tend to trust the leadership more than in the past. And the argument that comes out of that then is that people are now expecting more of business leaders. Um, and I think you start to see that now where, think about the recent period where a whole series of business leaders have come up to be very vocal on issues around LGBT rights, for example, uh, or the environment, uh, that the bar has gone up for what we expect. And I think that's really the next stage of progress in terms of people's expectations of, of corporate behavior. Very good. Let's, um, we'll open it back up to questions. We'll take this woman right down here. Um, hi, I'm Constanza. I'm a graduate, well, no, I'm an alumni now of the Masters of Public Administration at the LSE. Um, and my question was related to your point about decentralization, about how potentially to bring mm. that optimism that we have about our lives closer to the way in which policies is implemented. But as you also mentioned, as this has been addressed, a lot of the issues that we are facing today and because of the ways in which policy issues are structured now go beyond even the national level. Yeah. So how do we design policy in a way that is reflective of the way in which people perceive their lives and the way in which the problems are faced? Yeah, that's a good question. Any hands in the back there? How about that gentleman right in the center there? Yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is Andre. <clears throat> I'm from Brazil. And so that's the reality that I kind of come from and talk from. So uh, I would like to hear your thoughts, if maybe or maybe in the correlation between this that is being uh, said here about the relative relativity of wealth and this pessimism, and maybe a possible relation towards uh, with privilege because uh, as uh, our colleagues said I also come from the maybe 50 percent in Brazil I don't know how how's the percentage of people that are going to be less wealthy than my parents but to me that's not necessarily a problem and I think uh, just to make a dialogue with her questions like Maybe on one way we can feel happy about this is that if we only see this not only through our like relative wealthy wealth lens but an overall. So I think uh, I would like to hear our thoughts about how this sense of pessimism, what does it have maybe to do with the exposure of 
like global diversity and maybe the need to to see yourself in relation to others and then people perceive themselves like in a more less comfortable like not a uh, hegemonical narrative about the world. Right, thanks. And we'll take a question down here. The woman in, <laughs> in a denim jacket. I can't, I can't really see it from here, but uh, yeah. Mm. Hi, I'm Joana. I work in one of the social media companies. Um, so I wanted to follow up on the first question, actually, and the answer. Uh, how do you entangle the fact that even though media obviously has brought more um, exposure to bad facts or pessimistic facts, yeah. um, that brought uh, also exposure to corruption and to like <coughs> fake, um, fake degrees from politicians and all that. And if we agree that maybe the politicians should um, regulate this media, then we have an issue which is if they give the optimistic facts, then nobody gets attracted by optimistic facts. That's why we do have populists in place. And the other thing is that the previous media exposure, exposure uh, affected their credibility. So right now, there's no one to say, well, this is actually wrong because we're not so bad. Um, we wouldn't believe them. And because it, we, first of all, we have that bias national view. And then because we don't believe them, because they've been exposed before. So how do you entangle this? What do we need? We could need a third party, but we don't see any third party powerful enough. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm. Maybe I'll start uh, with the question on decentralization. I mean, you're quite right. It's a huge dilemma because yeah, I spent a huge part of my career in the international organizations which try and solve these global collective action problems. And the way the democratic legitimacy of those organizations came about was because they had boards, and on those boards were representatives of all the member states. Uh, I used to chair, I chaired 167 meetings of the board of the IMF, with 26 people around the table, each representing different countries or different groupings of countries, and they had to approve every decision we made. Um, and that was why it was considered democratically legitimate. Same with you know, the UN system, the World Bank, and, and all these international bodies. But to be honest, that is so far away from most people's lived experience. I mean, the democratic link between my vote for my local representative who goes to my parliament, who then might be in the cabinet, who then selects the person who represents me on the board of the IMF, I mean, that is just way, way, way too far away. I think one of the ways the international organizations have tried to restore some democratic legitimacy uh, is by operating these so what they call multi-stakeholder processes, <laughs> whereby they, can, they include civil society organizations. If they're developing, say, a new policy on climate change, for example, they involve lots of NGOs and they include non-governmental actors to try and legitimate. But to be honest, that is also not very democratic because those activists in the NGOs have their own agendas and don't necessarily represent all the citizens of the world. I think it's a really difficult subject. Look at the European Union and how they have struggled to have a democratic legitimacy. In the European Parliament now, people vote directly, but let's face it, participation in those elections is very, very low. So I don't really have an answer for you as to how do we do it. I think. Most people are not aware of the existing democratic link. I do think it's too far, and I think it's, uh, I think it's a big problem for figuring out how to solve big global problems where you need multinational cooperation. I think I'm going to leave the other two to you. I did not know that Minos had chaired 167 <laughs> meetings of the IMF board. Um, there must be a a tremendous reward for that, eternal <laughs> salvation, something, I don't know what, what it is, but, um, but um, you know, no wonder she, she seems to think that faculty meetings are brief. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 compared to that, um, I want to say something about the global local link and something about Brazil. Um, I am one of those rare birds who happens to believe that globalization is actually a pretty good thing. Um, However, I can see why not everybody 
gets the point. Um, and something that is very disconcerting for most human beings is the notion that my welfare is dependent very heavily on things that happen very far away and over which I have very little control. Uh, let, me, let me give you two very practical examples. Um, I come from a country that produces zero oil. Every, oil. every bit of oil we consume is imported. So the Chilean middle class is very proud of the fact that you know, everybody now um, can afford a car. And the price of fuels fluctuates widely because it moves with the price of oil and with the price of a local currency. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one month a liter of gasoline is 200 pesos, the next month a liter of gasoline is four or five or six or 700 pesos. Um, so my job was to explain to people that this was perfectly normal because there was a working of the market and in fact there was, you know, uh, a, a storm in the um, Gulf of Mexico which interrupted supplies and there was a disruption in Saudi Arabia and people look at you as though you're from Mars, you know. What, what, what does my livelihood have to do with something that happened in the Gulf of Mexico or in Saudi Arabia? Uh, but it does, of course. Another example is this. Um, some countries have pension systems in which you save over your lifetime, you earn the interest rate, and your pension is whatever you earned over that lifetime. When interest rates in the world collapsed 10, 15 years ago, the return on those accumulated pension savings also collapsed. So many people today work very hard, hard all their lives. They save, they put money aside, and today they realize that they accumulated no interest because the interest rate has been zero in much of the world for 15 years. And when you explain to that, which I actually, I've got a lecture to deliver on the subject tomorrow morning, that this is uh, the result of something called the global savings glut, uh, and it has to do with demographic tendencies in Japan, uh, and uh, a drop in the relative price of equipment in the US, people say, again, it's my life, my pension is going to be terrible, don't tell me about Japan. Um, and that link, which is very real but very hard to sort out, is a, a permanent source of distrust. Because if you happen to be the person doing the explaining, chances are the person doing the listening will think, rubbish, excuses, technocratic mumbo jumbo. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, it happens to be true, but it is very hard to convey that message. Brazil. Um, Brazil is, in fact, one of the most unequal countries in the world. We all know that. Um, the distribution of income is very unequal. The distribution of wealth is even more unequal. The distribution of political power historically was very unequal, uh, etc. Now, um, that every, everybody knows that. What a lot of people don't know is that, in fact, the distribution of income in Brazil has gotten actually quite a bit better in the last 15 years or so. Um, Mm -hmm. to some extent because of commodity prices, to some extent because of redistributive policies, et cetera, et cetera. And the big paradox is that the collapse in people's trust of politics comes at a time when distribution is in fact getting better, not worse. So the mechanical link that says, oh, people are very upset because the distribution of income is getting worse is wrong in most countries, Brazil being sort of exhibit one of that paradox. Uh, and that takes me to my observation early. It's a politics, stupid. I think one cannot understand uh, mm -hmm. Brazil without understanding simply the uh, collapse in, in, in the credibility of the political class for things that have nothing to do with, mm -hmm. with the distribution of income and which have everything to do with corruption, scandals, and payoffs, and a bunch of other things. Um, mm -hmm. And a very weak party system. <coughs> Brazil has 42 political <laughs> parties in parliament. 42. And I think that drives your point home. There's hope for economists. Uh, so, um, <laughs> so we have, um, so we've reached the point, we've run out of time for questions because we have to do the experiment. All so right. your reward for doing the poll is there's a reception outside uh -huh. afterwards, which we invite everybody um, for a drink afterwards. But if you could, um, they're going to put up the question. Uh, I think right now, yes, and um, so do you feel more pessimistic or optimistic about the future? Click 1A for mostly optimistic and 2B for mostly pessimist on your um, keypad uh, and nothing in between. Live. And nothing in between. And let me, let me just, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha!
<laughs> on Twitter right now, it's running about 57% optimistic. For some reason, Facebook's only around 50. Uh, look at that. <laughs> Are you voting frequently? Is that what yes. <laughs> Vote over and over again, as they say. Um, I'm really supposed to let this run hits. for a couple of minutes, but I think we're, it's not that hard, right? Everybody <laughs> like, oh, yeah. Okay, so that's great. Um, so I suppose we should, given these results, we should give the two of you an opportunity to comment on these decisive returns. <laughs> <laughs> recount, recount. <laughs> what do you I guess my, Following up on what we said earlier, I would want to throw the question back at the audience. Are you pessimistic about your own prospects or about the planets? Ah. Um, I'm sorry, you can't, we don't, you can't do that. Raise <laughs> <laughs> the question. Yeah. Um, I think you have to attend the rest of the LSE festival. Oh, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> that, yes, and and that's then a great way to close this. So, you know, it looks like, I mean, people are kind of, Completely they're smooth. undecided. And so you have the rest of the week to kind of work this out, a terrific schedule of events. And one of the things I think if, maybe this didn't turn you one direction or the other, but I think, please join me uh, in thanking both um, Manoush and Andres for a terrific presentation.